I agree with uh, Professor Graham Allison uh, that the contests uh, between US and China will intensify uh, over the next 10 years. And because this is uh, a result of what I call the iron law of geopolitics that uh, an established power will not allow a rising power to overtake it. But unlike uh, Professor Graham Allison, who said in his book, Destined for War, the book is called Destined for War, that war is more likely than not between US and China. Uh, I don't believe that a war between US and China is likely because if you have a war between two nuclear powers uh, and if they start using nuclear weapons, you don't have a winner and a loser. You have a loser and a loser. So both sides will lose millions of people. So that's why I think war, a direct war within US and China is uh, unlikely. But nonetheless, uh, it's extremely important uh, for both sides to understand that there is a danger of war. And therefore, as responsible countries, they should make every effort to prevent it from happening and they should therefore intensify their diplomatic exchanges because diplomacy was invented not to enable friends to talk to each other but to enable adversaries to talk to each other. And since the United States sees itself uh, locked in an adversarial contest with China, the United States should therefore step up its diplomatic exchanges with China. I think it was uh, one positive development uh, in 2022 uh, was the very good meeting uh, between President Xi Jinping of China and President Joe Biden of the United States uh, in Bali uh, during the G20 summit. I think that was an extremely uh, positive development because it enabled both sides to try and arrest the downward slide in the relations between the two. And as you know, one positive outcome of that meeting was a decision for Secretary of State Tony Blinken to go to China. Unfortunately, there was an accident over a balloon floating over the United States and that created uh, a new wave of anti-China hysteria in the United States. It made it very difficult for the Biden administration to send uh, Tony Blinken uh, to China. But I agree with one of America's leading commentators, Farid Zakaria, said in his uh, Washington Post column that the Secretary of State Tony Blinken should have proceeded with his visit to China because the diplomats need to meet not when relations are good. <laughs> diplomats need to meet when relations are bad. And clearly, relations between the United States and China today are bad. I mean, it's a fact. You can't deny it. So for that reason, the diplomats should be working harder rather than cancelling their visits to each other. I think um, the United States uh, congressmen uh, are behaving very irresponsibly uh, on the US-China contest because they, instead of trying to uh, carefully analyze the whole picture and figure out what are, you, what are the long-term interests of the United States and how to advance these long-term interests in the United States, which will be a mixture of competition and cooperation within the US and China. Instead, they are purely engaged in scoring political points domestically. And I think if you sacrifice your country's national interests in having a sober and sane relationship with China uh, in favor of scoring domestic political points for, to enhance your personal career, you're behaving irresponsibly. So I think the American people need to speak out, therefore, and tell their politicians that the US-China issue is too important to be left to political grandstanding. Uh, instead, they, they should step back and ask what is in the long-term interest of the United States and stop just trying to score political points against China. 
I can understand why uh, American politicians, uh, in an effort to win over support of the American people, uh, say, oh, this is a contest between democracy and autocracy. And of course, in the English language, democracy is always good, autocracy is always very bad. So they would like to portray it as a simple black and white thing. But in my book, Has China Won?, which has actually been translated and sold very well in China, I explain in Chapter 7 that this is not a contest between democracy and autocracy. This is a contest between plutocracy in the United States of America, where public policy decisions are made not to benefit the population at large, but the public policy decisions are made to benefit a small sector of the population, the top 10%, top 20%. And that's why uh, the standard of living of the bottom 50% of the America's population hasn't gone up in several decades. And I, and I think a plutocracy is therefore at a competitive disadvantage when it has to deal with a meritocracy in China because in China, the leaders are selected uh, on the basis of their experience and their ability uh, to run provinces, to run cities, and so on and so forth. So therefore, in, in this sort of contest, where the meritocracy is working very hard to improve the standard of living uh, of his own people, whereas the plutocracy is only interested in enhancing the uh, benefits for the top 20%, this is a competitive advantage for a meritocratic system over a plutocratic system. And Americans should step back and reflect on this and ask themselves, how did this plutocracy emerge in the United States of America? And as you know, uh, there is a lot of intellectual dishonesty in America when it comes to discussing the plutocracy because the Americans believe that you should call a spade a spade, right? And if you, call, you should call a spade a spade, you should call a plutocracy a plutocracy. But of course, this, uh, this would go against the political interests of the politicians, and therefore no politician in America dares to suggest that America has become a plutocracy, because in some ways, it is the US Congress that is responsible for the creation of a plutocracy because the US Congress takes money from very wealthy people to shape policies that will benefit the very wealthy people. And so since the US Congress is part of the problem in the creation of plutocracy, they are reluctant to discuss it clearly and openly. And that's going to be a competitive disadvantage for the United States. Uh, predictions about the future are very difficult mm -hmm. and uh, I mean it's, it's possible that China's economic growth may slow down dramatically and if China's economy for example grows at two or three percent a year then it will not be able to overtake the United States because the United States can also grow at two or three percent so clearly for China to overtake the United States it has got to continue growing at four to five to six percent a year. And uh, the question is whether or not you believe China can grow at four to five percent. And I actually believe that uh, China can, because uh, they are still, China is still educating hundreds of millions of people and raising their education levels and people with a higher education level with access to capital and other resources are able to be economically more productive and as they become more productive uh, their per capita GNP will go up and if their per capita GNP goes up the total GNP will also go up. So you know uh, it's important therefore uh, to ask the simple question can China's economy grow faster than the United States and traditionally uh, a country with a per capita income of only 10,000 like China should have the ability to grow faster than a country like the United States with a per capita income of over 60,000. I would say that uh, I'm not comfortable with the term de-dollarization. <laughs> you 
It is true that many countries are trying to reduce their dependence on the US dollar and this is an understandable uh, trend among the countries in the world because they have seen that the US government will use the US dollar as a weapon against you uh, if you are seen to violate some fundamental interests and concerns of the United States. And of course, the most extreme example of this took place uh, when the United States, together with its West European uh, friends, froze the assets uh, of the Russian Central Bank. Now that is actually, in theory, a violation of the sovereignty uh, of Russia because the uh, central bank assets belong to the sovereign country of Russia. But once the United States begins to seize the assets of other countries, it is natural for other countries to say, should I keep all my assets in the US dollar? What happens if the United States seizes my uh, assets? And that's why there is a trend towards countries reducing their dependence on the US dollar. But at the same time, in practical terms, there is no substitute for the US dollar in the global economic system. So uh, still, even today, even though countries are trying to sign trade contracts in other currencies like the renminbi, uh, most of the trade in the world is still carried out in the US dollars. But trade actually is not the big area. But there's a huge amount of financial transactions that take place in the world. And about 90% of financial transactions in the world still take place uh, in the US dollar. So uh, even uh, after the China's economy becomes bigger than the US economy, let's say it happens within 10 years, the dollar will still remain the global reserve currency for a long time to come. And it will be difficult for the renminbi to replace it unless uh, China has uh, allows free flow of money in the capital accounts. And that's not going to happen soon. So in view of this, I, I don't see an immediate uh, replacement for the US dollar. But within 10 to 20 years, if the United States continues to weaponize the US dollar, then it's possible that the, uh, the role and influence of the US dollar will not disappear, but will diminish significantly. The United States denies <laughs> that it is carrying out a containment policy against China. But it's interesting that uh, quite serious commentators uh, inside America, like Edward Luce of Financial Times, Farid Zakaria of Washington Post and CNN, uh, Max Boot, another commentator, have all said that the United States is carrying out a containment policy against uh, China and I think it's uh, important for the United States to assess whether such a containment policy can succeed or not succeed. Uh, I believe that unlike in the case of the Soviet Union where the containment policy succeeded because the Soviet Union hardly did any trade with the rest of the world uh, but in the case of China, since China trades more with the rest of the world than the United States does, uh, any effort to contain these Chinese trading relationships will fail. Because the rest of the world is benefiting a lot from its trade uh, with China. And that's why it would be wiser for the United States, uh, instead of going for a containment policy, should try to work out a policy of having agreed multilateral rules for all great powers when they interact with the rest of the world. And so, for example, in trading relationships, in investment relationships, in financial relationships, let's agree on a common set of rules uh, that we work out at the relevant multilateral bodies like the United Nations, for example, like the World Trade Organization or like IMF. And so I think it's important, therefore, uh, for the United States to consider the possibility that a wiser course than a containment policy would be a, a new, different form of engagement policy, but an engagement policy that takes place within multilateral fora, 
agreeing on a set of rules that all the countries of the world, including US and China, also agree on. Well, I think Hong Kong has a very important role to play uh, in terms of uh, <clears throat> providing uh, a different uh, autonomous space for American companies to establish themselves in before they begin investing in China. And the reason why it was very wise uh, for Mr. Deng Xiaoping to propose one country, two systems, uh, is that it provided a window into China that other, other companies could be comfortable with. Now, I know many uh, Anglo-Saxon media uh, writers say that uh, all Hong Kong has lost all its autonomy, is now part of China. That's not true. Uh, Hong Kong, in many respects, still remains an autonomous entity and still has its own rule of law and still has its own financial center, its own uh, stock exchange and so on and so forth. So I think actually uh, if American companies want to participate in and benefit from the uh, growth of China, it'd be wiser for them uh, to find ways and means of establishing themselves in Hong Kong and then using Hong Kong as the base from which they can then understand China and do business better in China. Well, I was very surprised <laughs> that China decided to play a mediator role in the uh, Saudi Arabia-Iran deal. And I was surprised because when I was a diplomat for 33 years, from 1971 to 2004, I noticed that Chinese diplomats were very hesitant to carry out diplomatic initiatives and they were quite happy to leave it to the Americans and Europeans to do it instead. It's a very positive sign that uh, um, China is doing so and in fact uh, I have launched something called the Asian Peace Program uh, um, in Sing at the National University of Singapore and in next month, in the month of May, we're coming out with an article uh, uh, praising uh, China's role in the uh, um, Iran-Saudi deal and suggesting the world can learn some lessons from China on how to um, uh, produce peace deals like that. And, and I know that uh, China will not be very, very active in this field but I think the world would welcome more peacemakers rather than peacebreakers in the world. And China could possibly be one of the world's best peacemakers. Well, uh, you know, I believe that the 21st century will be the Asian century. In fact, I produce a book of essays which is available freely uh, on the internet. Uh, and when the book was released, the publisher, a German publisher, expected 20,000 downloads of the book. Instead, there have been 2.9 million downloads of the book in 130, 160 countries. The reason I mention that is that countries around the world are preparing for the Asian century. They know that the Asian century is coming because the Asian countries are growing faster than any other countries in the world. But the only question is whether or not Asia will be a, whether or not the Asian century will be a peaceful century. So to help ensure that the Asian century will be a peaceful century, we have launched a very, very small initiative whereby we try to produce essays or podcasts that provide suggestions on how to bring about peace uh, in difficult areas uh, within Asia. And we hope that even though many of our suggestions may not be accepted immediately. In due course, if countries accept it, it will lead to uh, a, a safer, more peaceful world. For example, the, the reason why a skirmish happened between Chinese and Indian soldiers at the Sino-Indian border is because they had to go and check what's happening at the border with their own eyes. So we wrote an article saying, instead of using our eyes, why don't we plant sensors along the border and both sides can see through the census what is happening. 
So technology can solve some problems too. So uh, I believe that uh, China and India have begun planting sensors. We don't know whether it's because we suggested it, but it's a positive development. So we hope that if we come up with such concrete ideas that will help to prevent uh, conflicts, skirmishes, and save lives. And at the, at the end of the day, the most important thing the world needs today is peace. And we should work hard to uh, establish peace in Asia also. Well, uh, it's very clear, all the projections show that by the end of this century, uh, by 2100, India's population will be much bigger than China's population. And so by 2100, it's clear that uh, India's prospects of becoming the largest economy in the world will be much stronger because they'll have the world's largest population uh, at the end of the century. But I want to emphasize that the end of the century is still 80 years away. <laughs> and over the next uh, 10, 20 years, uh, I predict that China's economy will be number one, uh, United States economy will be number two, and India's economy will be number three. So it will take some time for India to catch up with both US and China. Well, I'm very optimistic uh, that the Belt and Road Initiative will continue to succeed and do well because the world as, at large uh, is very keen uh, to work with uh, China to improve their infrastructure. So many countries need new roads, new bridges, uh, new train uh, lines, new hospitals, and China is the world's uh, infrastructure superpower. Uh, it's building more infrastructure, I think, than the rest of the world. Combined. So, for example, in China today, I think has more miles of uh, uh, high-speed train network than any other than all the countries in the world combined. And so, with that expertise that China has, uh, it is capable now of sharing and exporting its expertise uh, to the rest of the world. And I think the, the China will find that most countries in the world will join the BRI. Some will not. I mean, the, uh, India will not, uh, Australia will not, Japan will not. But still, the countries are free to choose whether or not to join or not to join. And I believe uh, uh, more and more countries will, will want to join the uh, Belt and Road Initiative because they want to get better infrastructure, which will help to improve the lives of the people and improve the economic competitiveness of their countries too. When I was born in Singapore in 1948, uh, Singapore was a poor developing country. Uh, in fact, because I came from a poor family, uh, we didn't have enough food. So when I went to school, I was put on a special feeding program because I was technically uh, undernourished. And I, when I, my first 10, 12 years in my life, uh, we had no flush toilet in our house. So I lived in third world conditions in Singapore for the first 20 years of my life. And as a result of that, having experienced what poverty is like, I know how liberating it is to get out of poverty. And you notice that among the young generation of the, uh, the world in Hong Kong, in China, uh, the number of young people suffering from poverty in China is at an all-time low. So the fact that the, the China has been able to escape from poverty and provide opportunities to the young people is something that the young people should celebrate. Because the young people should remember that they today uh, have opportunities that their parents and grandparents didn't have. So they should take advantage of these opportunities and I would say the best way to take advantage of the opportunities is to engage the rest of the world as much as possible. So I would encourage the young people of China to travel and see the rest of the world, especially travel and see Southeast Asia, China's immediate neighbor. neighbor. Because the success of Southeast Asia in managing uh, a very diverse population 
uh, provides lessons for the rest of the world on how you can overcome difficult issues. So if the young people in China are looking for inspiring stories of multi-civilizational, multicultural understanding, they should go to Southeast Asia and become inspired. There's no doubt that if you look at the uh, if you don't, if you look at the top 10% of the population in America, the top 10% of the population in America has seen a dramatic improvement in their standard of living. And I'll give you one statistic. Uh, in the year 1978, the average salary uh, of the CEO in America was uh, 30 times the salary of a worker in the year 1978. But by 2021, the average salary of the CEO was 1,500 times bigger than the average salary of the worker. So you can see how the top 10% have improved their lives dramatically in America. But the bottom 50% have not seen any improvement at all. They have seen their income stagnate and uh, a Nobel Prize when uh, Angus Deaton has documented uh, all this in his book called The Deaths of Despair. So clearly there's something has gone wrong there in terms of the taking care of the common people in America. By contrast, uh, China has had the world's uh, largest poverty alleviation program and over 800 million people have been rescued from absolute poverty in, in China. And this obviously makes the people uh, happy and gives them a sense of hopefulness uh, for the future. Uh, I actually think that the United States can also do the same, can also improve the livelihood of its people because the United States is still the world's richest country. <laughs> and it has the resources to improve the lives of its people, but it needs to develop a new social contract between the very wealthy and the uh, people at the bottom, because if they don't do so, if America remains a troubled society, then America is going to elect populist leaders like Donald Trump, and that will be a problem for the United States of America. It's very sad that the leaders of Taiwan uh, have failed to educate their own population uh, on how dangerous the situation is going to be for Taiwan. Because uh, as the US-China contest uh, accelerates over the next 10 years, and it will accelerate for the reasons I've given in my book, Has China Won?, which as I, as I say has been published in China too. And in this game of geopolitical chess, Taiwan is a small pawn that could be easily sacrificed. So it's very important for the Taiwanese people to ensure that they don't do something that will damage them. And clearly, uh, if uh, Taiwan declares independence, this will lead to war because China cannot allow the secession of Taiwan from uh, China. So that